guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we, by we, I mean, I am joined by a special co-host, Ben Slick, who has been with us ever since the very beginning. He was on episode one. Ben Slick, thanks for making time this morning. Happy to be here. Welcome, everybody. Well, Welcome to episode 61 of Smart Water Wednesdays, uh, and we are going to feature some stories from Paul Bassett from Envacor, um, who is a great water manager that is involved in a lot of sustainability projects. So our idea for today is when did irrigation become a sustainability man manager's issue? Paul, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So. Uh, just to kick things off, um, I hope what I hope to do today is really introduce the idea of this sustainability conversation for my water managers. Most of the folks that uh, follow this show are irrigation guys by trade um, and are selling water management to HOAs and to commercial properties where the value proposition is uh, a little bit different than when we talk to the sustainability crowd. Um, it's the same process, it's the same deliverables, but um, what I hope to do today is just cover some ground that helps my kind of irrigation or landscape guys cross over into the mind space of the sustainability people um, and maybe not only wrap their minds around the value proposition, but some of the words and some of the uh, deliverables that you are involved in that, that they can key in on. Um, so to get started, let me jump in, Paul. Um, you and I met uh, a number of years ago on many projects, but most recently we worked together on the Denver Public Schools. Your team got a big shout out from Denver Public Schools when they were a guest on the show. Um, and when we were introduced on that project, you came to us through the energy management company, right? The, the McKinstry folks uh, were managing the project. Can you tell me uh, how that plays out for you, how you got involved with McKinstry and those guys? Yeah, so our primary business is dealing with the energy service companies, which are the ESCOs in, in theory and term. And Ben Slick and I have been working with ESCOs ever since the inception of my business 15 years ago. And an energy service company, who they are and what they do is they provide um, energy and water analysis and they get paid based on the energy and water that they save that particular facility. So the McKinstries of the world are an energy service company and a part of that project um, was water conservation. So they wanted to analyze the amount of water that was being used and they wanted to see if they retrofitted the irrigation systems, if it was able to reduce the, the consumption or the purchase of water from the current water authority and have the project cash flow, meaning if, it, if we put in new devices, would it produce a level of cash flow or return on investment with the, with the new equipment? So that's how we got involved with that particular project. And we're grateful too that the particular water manager was a big fan of, of HydroPoint. And that really was a big relief for our company as well, because, you know, we like to use your product because it's very good. That is awesome. So uh, just to back up on that conversation, the ESCOs of the world really um, supply all of the hardware. And then the, the measurable outcome is paramount, is they really the only thing that matters, because that's how that that is their deliverable that's how they make their money right is uh to deliver savings that um supply a, a feasible return on investment yeah yeah so so what we've learned in the business is every time you do you get involved with a, an esco project you basically have to write a business plan for every deliverable so what that means is we have to analyze all of the water all of the devices put together a cost um, to put in new, more efficient devices, and then what the cost is, and then what we anticipate the savings to be generated from that new investment. And then that has to meet within a certain um, return on investment in years. Um, so typically in a municipality, similar to Denver, um, they like to have the, the 
the paybacks in 10 years or less. Um, and then that, if it's 10 years or less in our, in our return on investment, um, then usually it would, it would be able to go to a construction opportunity. And typically the customer target for a um, McKenstry, you know, is the finance office of the Denver Public Schools. You know, they're really looking to sell a financial return. Um, the technology is incremental to that. I mean, the CFO doesn't care if it's a smart controller or a toilet change out. What he cares about is the amount of dollars that are saved on energy spend. But in many, in many cases, if the finance office isn't the point of entry, sometimes the ESCOs target the sustainability office. And so if there is a sustainability executive who is clearly publishing out goals uh, or publishing out sustainability reports on an annual basis, you know, she may be the target of the project as a way of entering. And then if they can communicate sustainability benefits that turn into financial benefits, she might carry them then into the CFO's office. So it's a, a differing strategy depending on the account that the ESCO is trying to target. That is correct, Ben. So when you're brought in, Paul, uh, do you have contact with the customer first or are you you partners with the energy management company. How does that play out? Yeah, usually we're a strategic partner with the energy service companies. Um, so when when they get an opportunity, uh, ideally, um, that they believe is going to be viable, then they bring us in and have us do the preliminary assessment is, is what we call it. Um, and the preliminary assessment is analyzing um, all of the utility bills, primarily the water consumption over a given period of time, usually three years. So, you know, we can make sure that we, we see different fluctuations in the weather patterns, ideally, right? Because right. it, it may be rainy one year and dry another year. And, you know, the rainy year, the water bills were low and the, the dry years, the water bills were high. We need to try to find the balance between the, those, um, those particular years um, to make sure we have a fair baseline that we establish as the consumption and then we look at that and say, okay, based on what equipment that we believe is in place now, um, there might be a 20 to 30% reduction in, in water. Um, and will that provide them enough savings to have this project be uh, sustainable? And then if that's the case, then we move to you know, the next level, which would be an investment grade audit. When everybody's agreed there's an opportunity here, we're all gonna now uh, invest into the project with our own time and money. Paul does a lot of important things for his customer, who is the ESCO, uh, and their customer is the end user. But one of the most important things he does is help that ESCO develop a defensible and reliable and accurate baseline. And it's the same for any project, really. If you don't know what the baseline is, how can you compare your results after commissioning new systems, no matter what they are, to know if they're effective or not, if you don't have a reliable baseline. So Paul plays an instrumental role in helping the ESCO deliver a measured and verified savings against a you know, scientifically derived data-driven baseline. And that baseline that you're talking about in, in sprinkler nerd terms, uh, I want to make sure I'm understanding. Uh, when, when I had Danny Smith on the show, we talked about creating a budget or no, it was Chad Sutton who helped me create a budget based on the landscape needs or the landscape irrigation requirement. So the square footage, the ET, is that what we're talking about for calculating no, a baseline? It's different. The landscape irrigation requirement is a target that you would irrigate to, but a baseline is what historically has been done. So okay. you want to see three years of historical usage, you know, and as Paul mentioned, average out the wet and the dry years to kind of create a, a medium ground. But you put that flag on the ground and say, before we did any work here, here's what you've been spending. And we're going to compare our savings of new, new controls, new fixtures, new measures that we commission against this baseline. And everyone has to agree that's the baseline. And the baseline doesn't change. Once you set the baseline, all savings year after year after year are measured against the original baseline. You don't try to compare yourself against yourself year over year. You stick to that baseline. That, that is correct. And, and Ben Coffey, just to, to tie in the, to Chad Sutton's analysis, um, we certainly do that analysis. And, and the reason we do it is the baseline is established based on what they've actually consumed in water and spent 
and water in a given baseline year, as Ben said. So we, we calculate it out and say, so based upon this square footage of, of landscape being irrigated and what they've actually consumed in the utility bill, they applied this many gallons per square foot. Now we do the, as, as Mr. Sutton said, we do the weather and ET analysis and say, okay, now the, the actual landscape requires this many gallons per square foot. So we look at what they spent and used the gallons per square foot. And then we look at what they what the landscape requires in gallons per square foot. And do they equal out? So did they use 20 gallons per square foot? And do they need 20 gallons per square foot? Then in a performance contract, we do not have an opportunity. OK, now, if they use 20 gallons and they need 10 gallons per square foot, do we have an opportunity? Yes, we do. OK. Now, if they need 20 and they, they you're using 40, you know, there's an opportunity as well, right? So it depends on really the baseline, as Ben said, and what is required and what is needed. So this ties beautifully into the sustainability officer's role and responsibility where she may already have good established baselines for her electricity use and her natural gas use. But in many cases, water has not been something that they've really gotten a good handle on what their baselines are. So. Paul brings to her a third leg of the sustainability stool. Her focus is primarily environmental and sustainability and resiliency oriented. And those are messages that they translate out into their you know, um, annual reports. There is a financial component, you know, but in the end, what they're trying to measure is what is the environmental impact? How have, reduced our, how have we reduced our water footprint as an enterprise? And how are we progressing against goals that we state 2025, 2030, et cetera? You know, some organizations just state we're going to reduce our total consumption of water by 20% in the next 10 years. How are we doing against that? Each year they hold themselves accountable and measure themselves against those stated goals. That's awesome. So I want to go back to um, the homework that you do, Paul. Um, and it, it sounds extensive. And I know that um, I don't know who this is for, either Ben or Paul. I know that. Internally, we provide some of that for our users, for our sales. Um, prospects, right? We do provide uh, uh, water analysis. We have the hydro analytics team that will do some of that baseline and ET comparison to, to make sure that a project is um, presenting a good business case. Um, first of all, Ben, can you tell me a little bit about what HydroPoint provides? And then Paul, I'd like to hear how much of HydroPoint's information are you using, if any, um, and how does it compare? So in the HydroPoint performed analyses, we get historical water data when we can, and that's either provided by the customer's accounts payable department by sending us scans of their bills, or if they use a utility management service provider like NG or ConService or RealPage, you know, we get a login and we pull data down from those online service providers. We analyze you know, at least a year. We like to get, as Paul says, three. Sometimes that's not always available, um, but when we do, we create you know, what the historical consumption baseline has been. We verify the water rates and the water agencies that we're seeing uh, from the, the bills. We then look at the landscape from Google Earth and we use measuring tools to caliper off what we believe the irrigated area is because a lot of the landscape irrigation requirement is dependent on the amount of area that is irrigated. We then sanity check those measured maps with the customer to make sure we didn't over or under map we then look at the plant ratio of turfs, shrubs, and trees to see you know, what percentage of each are on these properties because that's gonna determine the level of thirst each of the relevant plant types have. And then we run all that through our scheduling engine software to say, well, based on that kind of a landscape and based on that size of landscape and based on the microzone of where its weather is, you know, what would hydropoint water over a 12 month period? And then we graph that number and we compare it with the graph number of the customer's historical use. And usually, as Paul mentioned, the gap between those two curves represents the opportunity for savings. And uh, so for any WeatherTrack user who might be selling WeatherTrack or presenting a WeatherTrack project, um, what, do, what does HydroPoint need to, to get that project started? We need 12 to 24 months worth of water bill data or a login to the customer's utility provider system to get it. And then we need a map of the property if possible. If it's an apartment community, we need a rental map. If it's a retail center, we need a you know 
overview map or just give us the property address and then we'll map it ourselves and then can, you know, go back to the customer and make sure we didn't over or under map something. But that's really the basics of what we need. That's great. So uh, again, it sounds like we are just comparing the ET, the landscape irrigation requirement or the irrigation projected schedule to that baseline. Yep. Paul, is your process uh, in, or do you use those hydropoint tools or do you do that independently? Well, we, we, we do it independently, but we use the similar, you know, setup with regards to our preliminary assessment. Again, there's, there's two assessments that we do. Um, the preliminary assessment, as Ben said, that's the thing we do initially to determine the viability of an opportunity, okay? And, and we'll do that preliminary assessment. And if that preliminary assessment shows opportunity, as Ben said before, then we, we put together, you know, a, a return on investment based on that um, particular assessment. And if the client agrees to that preliminary assessment and that potential return on investment, then we move into what we call the investment grade audit, where we now boots on the ground. So the next step is from that point is, you know, we're going and, and going to all the controllers, extracting all the controller programming data. We are running through every single zone. We're counting every single head. We're doing flow rate calculations at that point as well. We either are gonna put on a, a meter on that supply line, or we're gonna calculate um, the flow rate on every zone based on the quantity of heads and the nozzles that are in the heads. And then now that we have all that data, we'll extract it and then put that into our next level of assessment to determine exactly what that irrigation system's applying in water per cycle. And then if we then put in smart controls and flow sensing, um, what is that precise savings potential going to be at that point? It sounds like a lot of work, but it really is necessary in Paul's business because his customer, McKenstry, is guaranteeing a savings to their customer. And then if they don't hit the guarantee, they write checks to that customer to make up the difference between what they promised and what was delivered. So Paul's investment grade audit needs to be very detailed and very specific and very precise. And it's a lot of work, but in the end, it produces very reliable results for the ESCO. That's yeah, awesome. and another, thi another thing we're doing too, um, Ben, is that we're identifying any faults or shorts in the, in the electrical system, okay, which is critical too to make sure, you know, if, if a valve doesn't open, you know, and we're going to go in and replace that, we need to know is, the, is it the wire or is it the valve, all right? Um, and then two, if there was threefold in our business when we analyze a system, we're looking at controls, number one. Then we're looking at flow sensing, number two. And then the third element is we're looking at the distribution system. And each one of them incrementally have some savings attributed to them. All right, controls are going to be the highest level. Flow sensing is the next level. And then distribution is the last level. And it just depends on, you know, what the appetite is for the customer to spend that additional money. And also, too, what, um, what, how much are they wasting? on each level of those particular incremental legs. So Paul, when you do those wet checks and you do that groundwork, do you identify broken components and let the customer know a list of repairs that need to be made and do those become part of your project to the, the ESCO or is that a separate process? Yeah, we do. We, we deliver that to our ESCO um, as a part of the project. Um, I, I see there's a there's a, an answer, a question came in from yes, Antonio. Yes, there's a question and it ties right into what you're talking about. So finish this and I'll read the question out loud for everyone. So again, yes, Ben, you know, again, what we try to do is um, point out every single deficiency as best as we can at the time we were there. Um, and then we apply a dollar value to the retrofit. And then we also tie a savings to that dollar value, hopefully. Again, controls or flow are going to be the highest return on investment. And then distribution is, is higher costs, less on the return side. But we want to, we want to paint the entire picture for the customer. Um, so if we do a project, uh, we want to turnkey it and deliver it with everything fixed and repaired when we walk out the door. That's awesome. So before I get to Tony Monzon's question, I have one of my own. Uh, the thing that I struggle with when presenting an ROI is the additional cost that comes with adding flow sensors. Um, and I just want to understand how you present that flow sensor as a, a, a super valuable part of the water management program and have that kind of play into the, the idea of the return on investment. 
Well, Ben, as you as we talked earlier, there's specific terms that really tie to performance contract, which is what we do. And, and one of the biggest, most important terms is measurement and verification of the savings. And the only way in an irrigation system to measure and verify that the savings are there is through flow sensing. So it is the most critical component in a performance contract to measure the flow of water in any given period of time and then verify that. Okay. And we verify that value against the utility bill that is provided by the municipality. So we look at all of the data that comes in through the weather track system, and, and then we compare that data, whether it's quarterly, um, annually, um, against the, the flow data that we're getting from our system to ensure that we're lining up and that we're actually saving water. Because it's at the end of the day, it's, did we reduce the utility bill? I mean, that's important. And that's where the flow sensors come in. For weather track power users, our budget manager feature is where the water bill data would be entered. And then one could run a report of measured usage and compare that against build usage aligned by the billing date so that those curves can be generated. And weather track budget manager can deliver a visual on how that all works. Um, I think uh, on the HydroPoint side, where we're dealing with customers who don't require a guarantee, many of those are on the commercial property management side, the owners of real property as opposed to municipalities and government agencies. You know, the, the, it's a two-step process where they might install weather track to start. They might see savings generated from weather-based adjustments to irrigation and maybe repairs that are made to irrigation systems that were identified as part of our commissioning. And then they may reinvest those savings in phase two into flow sensing and master valve technology. The, the, the real way of explaining this to a customer is, you know, if we saved you, you know, $7,000 a year on this irrigation system, there's no, there's no way of knowing whether or not a single main line break or a single two inch lateral line break could erode that entirety of savings if no one knows that that's there. And the only way you really know is flow sensing because no one's no one's around at night when irrigation goes off, right? So that's that's sort of the messaging to customers. And a lot of times we have a phase two project to sell flow sensing, or once we explain how flow sensing is really the insurance to make sure the savings that are generated from the control products and the repairs that are made are you know delivered reliably, they add to the project. Absolutely, that's correct. Awesome. So, Paul, I want to come back to you and I want to shoot Tony Monzon's question at you. She says, how do you account for the impact of irrigation system performance based on maintenance practices, as well as the proper programming and management of smart controllers in your long term water savings estimate? So uh, we all know that smart controllers don't save water all by themselves. It takes a manager to get it all in there and get it all done right. How do you ensure for your customers that um, they're programmed right and um, best practice when it comes to maintenance? Very good question. And, and that certainly comes up quite a bit in our business. So a lot of the times when we are doing an anal analytics of management, we look at their current practices and we apply a percentage of what their, their management is um, to the savings. And then we also then look at if they do manage the weather track system or the smart control system properly, we're gonna increase the pr proportionate percentage of the savings towards that. Um, now, again, what, what's gonna happen long-term is depending upon what the client chooses in their long going O&M services, is really what's gonna be reliable upon what the savings are gonna be. If they decide they're gonna have the O&M services in-house, um, then that particular factor of savings then comes down and then we reduce the, the savings percentage to the ESCO. Un unless the ESCO has us manage the control system and the programming, then we increase the percentage of savings that we're gonna achieve long-term. I um, mean, again, it just depends upon the end user, what they choose on the menu when it comes to long-term O&M. Sometimes long-term O&M may cost a bit more than that erodes the savings potential of the, of the project. And then, you know, for instance, on Denver Public Schools, um, they had a, a, an irrigation manager and they had irrigation um, service techs. So they're gonna be on top of the O&M savings 
um, to be able to increase the, the savings potential that was delivered. And it just, it varies on every customer and every client. Ideally, the more we can be involved with the long-term management of the system, the more viable I think the savings are gonna be in the project. So it just really depends uh, on, on what they select as their O&M services. And O&M for the listeners is operations and maintenance, right? So you're basically yeah. saying you can self-perform those functions with your own staff using our tools to alert yourself to where anomalies or problems exist. Or in some cases you abdicate that because your staff is short or busy on other projects. And so Paul's firm steps in and manages this thing, including alert resolution, dispensing people to go fix things that are broken, doing wet checks, you know, looking at nozzling, you know, just ongoing ensuring that those savings are persistent, um, which raises the confidence factor on the job. And one thing I would add on to that, Paul, is just based on our history together, uh, a shout out to your man, Dave Sims, who is top notch at this, um, who- uh, Dave Woods. Go Dave Woods, actually, yes. Dave Woods, sorry, Dave Woods. It's all right. Uh, Dave does all of the initial programming. So he is a sprinkler ninja uh, of the highest degree. And so we know going into the projects that that initial step of programming um, and getting all of the flow information incorrectly and, and station information incorrectly, um, we start on the right path. So um, I, I think that that's an important part of Tony's question. So if we step back just for a second and you know think about you know the, the side of the desk occupied by the sustainability officer, um, a great way of approaching her is to simply talk about you know what projects have you undertaken in order to reduce your energy footprint? You know electricity, natural gas, water. What are the results been? What have your lessons learned been? You know where does water fit in your strategy? You know have you overdone water and now you're on to other things or are you underperforming on water and you're looking to catch up? Um, what are your sustainability goals related to your water footprint? I mean, have you developed metrics for water use efficiency within your organization? And if not, do you need a partner to help you develop those metrics? I mean, those are great questions to get a sustainability manager engaged because she knows that there's a third leg to that stool that in many cases has been underused. And um, whether it's the simple things you could go and do a toilet retrofit inside a multifamily apartment complex, you know, and there's 300 units there with two toilets in each unit. That's very disruptive to the community, the tenant community. Whereas an irrigation retrofit and a, you know, over in a, in a wet check of the irrigation system is non-disruptive and, you know, can achieve, frankly, more savings than the toilet retrofit. All right. I know we're approaching time, but there was one thing I wanted to double back on with Paul's earlier comments. You said earlier that when you looked at their baseline and if they were at uh, 20 and they were supposed to be at 20, there wasn't an opportunity. But if they were supposed to be at 10, there was an opportunity and I get that, right? Then you went on to say, if they're supposed to be at 20 and they're at 40, uh, there's an opportunity there as well. Um, so that leads me to believe that if their practice is underwatering, there's still a conversation to be had. Is that, am I putting words in your mouth? No, no, you're correct. So a lot of times, for instance, uh, Ben, we'll just use Denver Public Schools as, as an example, because that's fresh in, in everyone's mind. When we looked at, you know, all 47 controllers out there, more than half of them were in a deficit irrigation meaning they, they weren't meeting the demands, at least at the time when we analyzed the, the irrigation of the turf grass, because that's primarily what we're watering out there. Um, but what, what the technology will allow them to do if, if they still want to maintain deficit irrigation, but do it in a manner where they can manage it remotely with the control systems, they can still deficit irrigate. And, and the systems that were um, excessively irrigating or you know, overwatering we can then bring that down to ET, and then we can take the savings from those to pay for the irrigation systems that are going to, and then also use that savings to help hopefully um, offset some of the deficit irrigation cost because we're not going to gain any savings on those. But at least it allows them and has the tools globally to manage deficit irrigation because that's really what we want to do. We, we want to deficit irrigate because that's where savings comes in. If you always manage to ET, um, it's still beneficial, but if you want to drive down savings, 
as a sustainability manager, you want to go to deficit irrigation. And that's the, the tools that you have with HydroPoint allows you to go to deficit irrigation. So that was where the heart of my question was, is um, when you talk about switching to central control, is the, the management cost a part of that conversation in your world, right? The yes. reduced uh, maintenance and the improved visibility and the truck rolls that we talked about with Mark Hurd, is that something that comes into your sustainability conversation? Every time we do a program, we have to put in some level of management. I mean, th these are not tools that you can just go and let them, you know, run themselves. They have to have a manager involved with programming and analytics and alert detection and dispersion of, you know, the alert to have someone go fix the, the break. Yeah. In many cases, the time and motion studies involved with introducing central control to do just that, to improve maintenance use efficiency, to give workers a mobile app in 21st century technology, as opposed to having to run and touch every timer. Um, you know, all those things can be part of a, a cost offset. And the, the CFO who is deciding a paper the energy services contract might allow those as ancillary benefits or might not, but they certainly behind the scenes get talked about by the customer to say, we're going to just be more efficient. This is going to lie, a system like this could help us avoid hiring another staff or another two staff members because the system itself acts like a staff member. It tells us where the problems are as opposed to us having to run around every day and go look for the problems. So, you know, those are definitely conversations that get had. Um, there's also the idea of operational consistency. So if you've got half of your city or half of your school district on a central control system and the other half not, you know, you're not optimally efficient for your staff. Um, so there's conversations there that help bring along, um, you know, even non-performing sites, even deficit irrigated sites into the mix, just so you have a consistent operational standard. That's awesome. All right, we are headed in on the, the quitting time here. So I, I want to, uh, Go to Paul and Paul, for every first time guest on my show, they all get the same standard question. So what is your take on what does WeatherTrack save you? What, what it saves me is it, it's the proof that when I produce a project and I tell my client, we're gonna save X amount of dollars WeatherTrack is the proof in the pudding that I display to them. So it's really all about the money that we get to save. So WeatherTrack, ideally at the end of the day, helps me and my clients save money. That's awesome. All right. Thank you for that. Let me jump to the teaser for next week. Uh, I've got next week's show. Oh, always want to tout support. If there's anything we can do to support your success out in the field, we want to be doing that. Uh, and next week, we're going to jump into a very often misunderstood weather track feature called Mad Limit Switch. Uh, this is something that I'm anxious to get into the details of because I see this one causing a lot of questions when people are setting up controllers. So it'll be a great conversation, uh, not only of how it works, but my recent guest, Tony Brucia, has... Uh, a great way of using that, an innovative look on how he's using that feature. So I'm anxious to tell you how the feature works and talk about some of the opportunities that it presents. Um, so with that, Ben, Paul, thank you so much for making time this morning. This was great. Um, any closing thoughts, Mr. Slick? I'm grateful to have a customer like Paul to help deliver our results. He's, a, he's not a customer, really. He's a partner and candidly a friend, you know, and we've worked together through a lot of interesting situations and come out the victor on those. And so um, we just look forward to supporting him and his business efforts at every turn. And Paul, any closing thoughts from you? Well, one of the things I am grateful for is the partnership that our company has with, with HydroPoint because um, every time I produce a project and deliver uh, a savings analysis, and then we implement a project the, the systems have always been delivering for the 15 years that I've been working with WeatherTrack. Um, and I know, I know we still have projects that we've done. Controllers are still operating and we're still generating savings. So it's a, it's a mutual beneficial uh, relationship. That is awesome. So like Ben said, thank you so much for your continued support. And we look forward to all the projects in the future. Um, and 
Thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode of Smart Water Wednesdays. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.